In this video we're continuing with population ecology, so this is part two, and we'll specifically be looking at the interactions and the relationships within populations. The first relationship we'll be looking at is called the predator-prey relationship. Now we already learned about this in grade 10 and 11, and a predator-prey relationship is the biological interaction between organisms, the one that hunts and the one that is being hunted. Please don't say the definition is the relationship between the predator and the prey. That's not descriptive enough. One of the first things that you'll need to know is you need to understand what are the advantages of predation. Now the best way to understand this is if we look at a graph like this. Time is represented on the x-axis and population size or number of individuals is represented on the y-axis. There's always two curves on this graph. The one represents the number of prey and the other represents the number of the predators. Now the problem is you might be getting a graph like this in an exam and then they ask you to identify which of these lines would be the prey and which is the predator. The line that goes the highest is usually the prey. This is because if you think of the prey um, as a buck, you always would need more buck in an, in, in an area for the lions to feed on. So the line that goes the highest, as I said, would be the prey. The second hint to know which line is which is to look at the trend. The predator is always following the trend of the prey. On this graph you can see the red line, which is the prey, starts increasing first. Soon after that the blue line, which is the predator, also starts increasing. This is obviously because the prey is the food to the predator. So as we have more food, we will have more um, predators. As soon as there's too many predators, the prey gets eaten up too quickly and then their, their number starts dropping. So we can see the red line starts going down as the prey numbers start decreasing. And then soon after that, the predator numbers start decreasing because they ran out of food. So from this graph, we can actually see that the main advantage of predation is that it prevents the overpopulation of a the prey by regulating the population size of the prey. Now although we're always using the lion chasing the zebra as a typical example of predator-prey relationship, don't be surprised when in an assessment you get an example like this where ladybugs actually hunt and kill and eat or preys upon plant lice. The ladybug is the pr uh, predator and the plant lice are the prey and again these guys in your garden will be ideal to have because the ladybugs actually control the population size and prevents overpopulation of plant lice. Now besides the predator-prey relationship, the other type of relationship we find within populations is what we call competition. Now there's two types of competition, intraspecific and interspecific. Be careful not to mess up the spelling. Intraspecific competition occurs when individuals of the same species compete, uh, compete for resources at the same time, while interspecific competition occurs when individuals of different species compete. Now here you can see examples of that. When two bucks of the same species fight to get the attention of a female, it's called intraspecific competition. When a lion and a hyenas fight over prey, they are different species making an interspecific competition. Organisms can compete for food and space and water, shelter, uh, mates for reproduction, but if they could reduce the competition, it would actually give them a better chance of survival. And that brings us to resource partitioning, which is any strategy that an organism employs to reduce competition. We find two types of resource partitioning. The first is called temporal resource partitioning and the second is spatial resource partitioning. Now temporal partitioning is when two species will use the same resource but at different times. It's easy to remember because temporal and time both starts with a T. Spatial resource partitioning is when organisms use the same resource, but in this case they use different parts of it or different sections. If the word sections starts with an S, same as spatial, maybe thinking about different sections is going to remind you because both is with an S. 
We can see spatial resource partitioning in the way trees and plants grow in a forest. Because they are in competition for light, they grow at different heights, meaning they need different parts of the same resource. So you'll have the canopy at the top needing direct sunlight with the ferns and the mosses at the bottom, which needs less sunlight. So in this way, they all survive using different parts of the same resource. We also see spatial resource partitioning in herbivores that feed on the same resource at the same time, but using different parts of it. So here we see three different herbivores eating thorn trees or acacias, but at different heights. So we've got the giraffe eating the top leaves from the tree. Then we've got the impala eating the midsection. And then the little dacre would be eating the shoots um, around the bottom of the tree. So they're not in competition one, with one another because they eat different parts of the same resource. Temporal resource partitioning is used by these two little hunting spiders. The nocturnal wolf spider would be hunting and predating and eating during the night. And then during the day when he is sleeping, he's um, chomy over here. The diurnal jumping spider will be eating in the day. So they can eat the same things, but because they employ it at different times, they're not in competition. Now, certain animals will have a very special way of organizing themselves in a social manner that will increase the survival of the entire population. And the first way in which they do this is by f forming a herd or a flock. Now, the advantage of herds and flock is that it will um, avoid predators much easier. If you think, for example, at the Villa Beast on the Serengeti or flocks of Kulea birds living together. A herd of villabeers on the Serengeti can be made up of up to 10,000 individual animals. And what's the advantage of this is the fact that because the herd is so big, predators are bound to attack the outer perimeter of the population. So the further inward you are in this massive group, the less you chance is that you'll be attacked. The same is true for the Kulea bird. Now these guys also live in these huge flocks, up to thousands of birds, as you can see over here. And when they even nest, they make these massive nests taking over an entire tree. As they make these massive, massive colonies of nests and flock together, again there's protection in numbers. Because if one finds food somewhere, he'll come back, tell the rest, and they will all swarm onto wherever the food is and get food. Protection as well, living in a tree, lots of birds together, there's more eyes to see when there's a snake coming into the tree, bringing protection for all of them. The second way of social organization animals employ is called living in a pack. So animals that form packs have successful hunting strategies, as we see especially in the wild African dog. Wild dogs also reproduce by using a dominant breeding pair. Now what that means is that only the male and the female, the alpha male and the alpha female, will be allowed to breed. None of the other animals, which means the offspring has a greater chance of inheriting strong genes from their parents. Now these cute pups are also protected by the social organization within the population of wild dogs. Because what will happen is that the elderly animals will actually not hunt anymore. They're going to stay close to the den babysitting and caring for the young pups. That would mean the individuals that actually do go hunting are the stronger adults and they actually hunt as a pack in a group which allows them to bring down larger prey and hunting more successfully. In ants and termites and bees we see task division amongst different individuals within this last group and that is the third type of social organization that we are looking at. I'm sure you've seen some of these guys flying all over, the all over the place after a nice bit of rainfall. And this is actually what we call a termite allate. Here we see a termite king and queen. Now the job of the king is just to impregnate the um, queen. In other words, to mate with her continuously so that she can lay thousands of eggs. Now you can see this queen, how her abdomen is super big. So her job is just to stay in one place in the middle of the nest and actually lay these eggs. She doesn't go out to try and find food. 
The workers in the Connolly will go out and find the food, bring it back, and actually feed the king and the queen, and the growing little um, larva. The queen is just laying the eggs while they just do the work, and then I'm sure you've seen some soldiers around as well, that brings protection to the hive or to the nest. You see the same thing in bees. Now because these animals live together in a big colony like this, and everybody has a specific little job to do, it brings protection, corporate protection, for the whole colony. So the last thing that we are looking at in this video is how a population within an ecosystem will recover or start off with from scratch. So how is a population or an ecosystem formed in the first place? And it happens in two ways. The first one we're looking at is called primary succession. Primary succession will happen when an area has had no soil. So if there's no soil to start off with, how will a population settle in this area? So primary succession is really defined as a gradual change over time in an area where there's no soil and there was no plants growing previously. And from the photo you can actually see, we'll see something like this happening in an area where we, we've had a volcanic eruption. So in this diagram you can actually see the steps that the environment will go through or the stages it will go through to actually recover. Now the biggest problem is obviously you starting with bare rock. There is no soil to start with in the first place because soil would actually contain the necessary minerals and some seeds even. But if you start with bare rock you've got nothing. So this first stage is called the pioneer stage. During the pioneer stage, you'll actually have lichens starting to grow on the rock. They'll actually break it up to create soil. Now the lichens, as they grow on this rock, it's going to decompose and actually add nutrients into this new soil. Once this has happened and there's a tiny bit of soil with a little bit of nutrients in, mosses, which is the most simple plant, is actually going to start growing in any little hollowed area, followed by ferns and grasses. Now, as these plants also grow, they actually crack open and force more soil to be made. And as they decompose, they keep adding mineral elements to the soil. And that brings us then to the second stage, which is the intermediate stage. And now we will actually see small, hardy, woody plants followed by some shrubs and perhaps even very small trees starting to grow in this part that's now soil. Again, as plant growth increases, there will be more soil as the roots of the plants break up more and more of the rock, as well as more nutrients going into the soil because of decomposition of new plants. And that brings us to the climate stage, which is the ultimate. And now the, the ecosystem has recovered completely. And this is when we will see big plants, big trees, mature plants. Now only the ecosystem has recovered completely. Primary succession will take a very, very long time, obviously. It can take centuries to recover after a volcanic eruption because it's the hardest job is obviously to get the rock broken and to produce soil. Once all the plants has come in, then little animals will come first and bigger animals will follow. So most of the time, you will have this when there was a volcanic eruption. But more often you'll see the process called secondary succession. And this would be a gradual change or a recovery in a community following some kind of disturbance where the species was removed but the soil remained. So in this case, you don't start with bare rock there is already some soil. So you'll see this in areas like on the photo here where you see deforestation that happened, has happened, or in the case of a fire. If you look at this diagram, you'll see that when you, once you start with a fire, you actually do have soil remaining. So the pioneer stages will look much different. You will very quickly have herbs and weeds growing. There's no need for lichen because you don't need rocks broken. So after the herbs and the weeds, you'll have some grasses growing, which brings us to the intermediate stages, again with small trees and shrubs, followed by the climax community, and that obviously depends on the type of biome, but in a forest scenario, it would be large trees.